The experience that my family and I had of living together, coexisting uh, with Arabs, gives me reason for hope that what happened once in the Middle East can be um, um, can happen again. The Arab revolts between 1936 and 39 were raging against British imperial forces and the Zionist movements alike. Throughout Palestine and in Jerusalem in particular, skirmishes were becoming routine. All the while, Jewish migration during the Fifth Aliyah was intensifying and Allied forces were confronted on every side during the war. On the ground, the people of the Middle East were going through a renaissance of identity. Some Arab people began to see Islam as their nationality in the face of Zionist settlements and imperial forces. Others started to adopt their new nationalist identities as the Western colonial forces found themselves otherwise occupied during the war. Oil became more and more important to the developing world, especially in feeding the war machine. Arab states began pulling away from one another as they sought to harden the borders and secure their futures in a post-industrial and modern world. Still hanging in the balance were the Jews, Christians, and Muslims of Greater Palestine, the outlier consigned to a bizarre nation-state purgatory. Pre-industrial feudal relations persisted among different factions that had yet to organize into classes that had formed in Western imperial societies. Therefore, no formal political movement had developed along class structures, and the absence of formal state borders meant that there was just pockets of ethnic groups from landowners and farmers to militant groups and laborers. And yet, the imperial forces, who were being ravaged during World War II, were attempting to impose a nation-state plan on a territory that hadn't fully transformed along with the surging capitalist regimes of the time, and the territory itself was being flooded by Jewish refugees from the war. Confronted with the horrors of the Nazi Judenrein policy, the flood of refugees came imbued with a sense of urgency and Zionist fervor, encapsulated by leaders like Weissman, who sought to resolve what Jewish historian Avi Schleim referred to as, quote, ongoing dispute between the political Zionists and the practical Zionists. The political Zionists, following in Herzl's footsteps, gave priority to diplomatic activity to secure international support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The practical Zionists, on the other hand, stressed the organization of Jewish immigration to Palestine, land acquisition, settlement, and the building of a Jewish economy there." End quote. Another powerful Zionist leader named Zev Jabotinsky emerged as the head of a group called the Irgun, which included a young Menachem Begin. Here's Jabotinsky in his own words. Quote, we cannot promise any reward to either the Arabs of Palestine or to the Arabs outside Palestine. A voluntary agreement is unattainable. And so those who regard and accord with the Arabs as an indispensable condition of Zionism must admit to themselves today that this condition cannot be attained and hence that we must give up Zionism. We must either suspend our settlement efforts or continue them without paying attention to the mood of the natives. Settlement can thus develop under the protection of a force that is not dependent on the local population behind an iron wall which they will be powerless to break down." End quote. Militant Arab resistance was now met with organized Israeli force in the Irgun and other movements, and clashes were commonplace. In 1937, another British invention called the Peel Commission declared that Palestine was to be carved into three distinct territories, with 20% allocated to a Jewish state the balance being united with Jordan, and a third zone that incorporated holy cities of Jerusalem and Nazareth into a British-controlled protectorate. Every side rejected it, most especially the Arabs, who were tired of being stripped of self-determination. Then the British reversed their stance two years later and issued a white paper in 39 that called for Palestinians just to work it out amongst themselves, but set a limit on Jewish immigration at 75,000. This time the Zionist leaders balked at the plan and were incensed that the British would just walk away. As the war raged on, the Zionist movement decided to take matters into its own hands and called a meeting in New York at the Biltmore Hotel. The findings would become known as the Biltmore Program. The conference proclaimed the following, quote, the conference urges that the gates of Palestine be opened, that the Jewish agency be vested with control of immigration into Palestine and with the necessary authority for upbuilding the country, including the development of its occupied and uncultivated lands, and that Palestine be established as a Jewish commonwealth integrated into the structure of the new democratic world." End quote. David Ben-Gurion emerged as the recognized leader of the movement, and he went on a campaign with the world powers to champion statehood and to raise funds for armed resistance. 
Interestingly, while the world was in complete disarray, Palestine was experiencing somewhat of an economic surge as it served as a feeder system to the wartime economy of the other nations. So as Gelvin writes, quote, it's been estimated that by the war's end, there was full employment in Palestine, end quote. The end of the war quickly became decision time. A weary Europe was anxious to settle the Middle East question and put the economy back together. The United States was instantly recognized as the lone superpower in the world for a couple of years at least, while Russia recovered from staggering losses during the war. President Truman, on the advice of Earl Harrison, who was in charge of creating a plan for displaced persons after the war, urged the British to pave the way for 100,000 Jewish refugees to Palestine. Now, the British seized on this opportunity to draw the United States into the mix, and the British suggested a joint commission to figure out if the U.S. could defray the costs of Jewish settlement to Palestine and to protect them. Now, this time, the U.S. balked. The Zionist movement was beginning to splinter at this time as well. The militaristic wing of the party and the paramilitary organization Irgun were pressing for revolution. In 1946, it even carried out the terrorist bombing of the King David Hotel, British headquarters in Jerusalem. The blast killed 91 people and sowed chaos into the discussions. At the same time, the political Zionists, like Ben-Gurion, knew that they had the sympathies of the world that just learned of the atrocities of the Holocaust, so they were in a solid position to push for the Zionist dream of statehood. The only question was, who had the authority to make this happen, and could they secure the approval of the United States? Here's Galvin. Quote, in February 1947, the British threw up their hands and dumped the Palestine question on the newly founded United Nations. The United Nations General Assembly Commission, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, UNSCOP, made up of representatives from Sweden, the Netherlands, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Australia, Canada, India, Iran, Guatemala, Uruguay, and Peru, to investigate the Palestine problem and make recommendations, end quote. An interesting gathering of people talking about somebody else's self-determination, but anyway. The plan called for a termination of the mandate and a partition plan between the two communities that called for them to unite economically and to place Jerusalem under international control. As Galvin noted, however, though, quote, for the record, the minority report recommended the establishment of a single federal state, end quote. As one can imagine, there was hardly a consensus on the 1947 partition plan. Even the United States military and intelligence communities were against it, predicting that it would lead to chaos and hurt relations with the newly established Arab governments. Neither the Jews nor the Arab Palestinians could claim any sort of victory as the plan didn't call for official statehood. It was just another plan to make a plan without the consent of the people who lived there. Another complicating factor was neighboring Jordan under the rule of King Abdullah since the end of World War I. Abdullah played every side of the chessboard. As Khalidi writes, quote, both the king and the British opposed allowing the Palestinians to benefit from the 1947 partition or the war that followed, and neither wanted an independent Arab state in Palestine, end quote. This is surprising to most Westerners who assume that the Arab nations are all aligned. Well, they're not, and they've never been. And as we've stated before, once the Arab territories were formed and then quickly gained independence from their imperial masters, they had a lot of work to do to build their nations. Abdullah much preferred the 1937 arrangement that placed the West Bank mostly under Jordanian control. However, his duplicity only went so far as we'll see in the next section when he opposed the Zionist army in 1948. As Avi Schleim noted, quote, It was hardly an exaggeration to say that the British colluded directly with the Transjordanians and indirectly with the Jews to abort the birth of a Palestinian Arab state, end quote. The Nakba, or catastrophe, is the war that lasted from the fall of 1947 until May 15, 1948. There are two narratives that have emerged from this period. You have the Zionist narrative, which is the Jews accepted the partition plan and were willing to live in peace alongside their Arab brethren. But the Arab nations rejected the plan and instead chose to invade Israel. Vastly outnumbered and surrounded on all sides, the Zionist Davids beat back the Goliath armies and fulfilled the prophecy of the Israelites. The Palestinian narratives claim that the brave Arabs bested the colonial Zionist forces in the battles before imperial Western forces intervened with firepower and corrupt neighboring regimes abandoned them in their darkest hour. Let's assemble the pieces of the puzzle that our main sources agree upon to get a clearer picture of what transpired. So the UN created UNSCOP in May of 1947. The partition plan was offered at the end of August. 
Irgun militants bombed a police station in Haifa in September, killing British and Arab officers. The UN approved the UNSCOP plan on November 29th, and then Palestinian militants killed seven Jewish civilians near Jerusalem the next day. That's how the war began. So let's start with Galvin here. Quote, in 1948, the Arab states were divided into two rival camps, Jordan and Iraq on the one hand, and by default, Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia on the other. Because Jordan and Iraq were ruled by two branches of the same Hashemite family that enjoyed a close relationship with the British, leaders of Egypt, Syria, and Saudi Arabia feared a British-backed Hashemite conspiracy intent on dominating the Arab world. Making matters even more complex, the leaders of Jordan, Egypt, and Iraq each had ambitions to lead the Arab world. As a result, there was no agreement on strategy or war aims in 1948. Avi Shlaim called the Arab coalition one of the most divided, disorganized, and ramshackle coalitions in the entire history of warfare. The self-proclaimed new historians note that while Arabs indeed outnumbered the Israelis of the Yishuv, which is uh, what the Jewish part of Palestine was referred to prior to statehood, Palestinian Arabs had never fully recovered from losing 15% of the male population in the Arab uprisings. They characterized the newly formed Arab units of neighboring states as closer to domestic police than trained military fighters and more interested in maintaining local rule than fighting someone else's battles. Of all the states, Egypt and Jordan were the most prepared. Egypt had been independent for a while and had aligned with the Soviet Union. And Jordan's military apparatus had the benefit of British training and weaponry. But remember that their interests weren't necessarily aligned. Here's Khalidi. In the first phase of the Nakba, a pattern of ethnic cleansing resulted in the expulsion and panicked departure of about 300,000 Palestinians overall, and the devastation of many of the Arab majority's key urban, economic, political, civic, and cultural centers. The second phase followed after May 15, when the new Israeli army defeated the Arab armies that joined the war. In belatedly deciding to intervene militarily, the Arab governments were acting under intense pressure from the Arab public, which was deeply distressed by the fall of Palestine cities and villages one after another, and the arrival of waves of destitute refugees in neighboring capitals. In the wake of the defeat of the Arab armies, and after further massacres of civilians, an even larger number of Palestinians, another 400,000, were expelled and fled from their homes escaping to neighboring Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and the West Bank and Gaza. None were allowed to return. Even former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak called it a, quote, shattering exile of a whole society, accompanied by thousands of deaths and the wholesale destruction of hundreds of villages, end quote. This was accomplished by Begin's Irgun and Ben-Gurion's Haganah, which crafted a campaign called Plan Dilet, or Plan D, to depopulate major urban centers prior to the close of the war. Zionist revisionist history claims that Arabs were allowed to stay if they didn't resist, and that many assumed it would be temporary. Well, they weren't, and it wasn't. A little more than half of the entire population of Arab Palestine became refugees. The Arab armies of the other nations entered a war that was already underway due to pressure from Arab citizens alarmed by the flood of refugees and the Arab leaders sitting on their hands. Israel was way more prepared to battle on a large scale. So the only thing left to the international community was what to do with the refugees and Jerusalem. Having established central command and authority over military affairs, Ben-Gurion and the newly formed parliament in Israel, called the Knesset, turned to domestic affairs. Of primary importance was the settlement of their newly acquired territory to prevent the possibility of Arab return to the countryside and cities. In 1950, the Knesset passed the Law of Return, sometimes referred to as birthright, which stipulated that, quote, every Jew has the right to immigrate to the country, end quote. According to Galvin, quote, the Israeli government took over approximately 94% of the property abandoned by the Palestinians who fled and distributed it to Jewish Israelis. Some Palestinians attempted to reclaim their property by crossing the armistice lines to harvest crops or carry away movable property to their new homes. Others crossed the lines to commit acts of sabotage or murder. The Israeli government did not differentiate between the two groups. To deal with the problem of infiltration, Israel launched reprisal raids against the states from which the infiltration occurred. In 1953, an Israeli raid into Jordan resulted in 69 civilian deaths, mostly women and children. In 1955, an Israeli raid on an Egyptian military post in Gaza 
left 38 Egyptian soldiers dead and about 40 wounded. Both raids were led by future Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. End quote. 700,000 new immigrants arrived in the first four years of Israel's existence. Another 700,000 arrived over the next 15 years. Now, over the next few years, skirmishes continued as the state of Israel steadily weaponized and gained more control over its newfound territories. The occupied parts of Palestine were fully under martial law at this time, but resistance forces remained. According to Palestine Nexus, in April 1956, quote, Palestinian militants infiltrated Israel from Gaza and attacked the Shafrir Synagogue, killing six Israeli children. In response to events like this, Israel doubled down on the occupied territories in an attempt to snuff out the resistance. In Gaza, its efforts were particularly severe, killing and executing thousands of resistance fighters, causing most of the remaining fighters to flee to the West Bank. In one of the more brutal incursions of the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunis, Israeli soldiers lined up refugees against a wall and executed 275 people, according to the United Nations. One of the survivors was an eight-year-old boy named Abdel Aziz Al-Harantisi, who would go on to co-found Hamas. But long before Hamas came into being, another organization was founded by a Palestinian militant named Yasser Arafat. The organization was called Fatah, and Arafat would run it as a paramilitary group from exile, running raids and skirmishes and providing the spine of the Palestinian resistance. Because it found safe harbor outside of the occupied territories, Fatah was more difficult to pin down. Within the occupied territories, the people attempted to organize politically and created the Palestinian Liberation Organization, a disorganized and toothless group that Arafat would eventually lead, especially after the next defining war. On 14 May 1967, Gamal Abd al-Nasser placed Egyptian armed forces on maximum alert and sent the Egyptian army into the Sinai Peninsula, writes Kelvin. Egyptian newspapers reported that Nasser's actions were a response to the information provided by the Soviet Union that Israel was planning to attack Syria. To be clear, Syria had been provoking Israel in the Galilee region and tensions were running high. But as Dennis Ross writes in The Missing Peace, Hafez al-Assad, defense minister of Syria at the time, quote, did not launch a major invasion of Israel. When the Israelis attacked the heights and found their way up them, the fighting was tenacious. But Assad was not going to see Syria's army destroyed and ordered a retreat even before the Israelis had completed their conquest of the heights, end quote. Now, most agree that the Soviet report was false. And some believe that Nasser knew it was. Some believe that he gambled that Israel would strike first, thereby stripping away their diplomatic cover. But as Galvin writes, if this was the case, it was a miscalculation. In the first hours of the war, Israeli airstrikes destroyed 90% of the Egyptian Air Force, about 70% of the Syrian Air Force, and almost all of the Jordanian Air Force. They'd taken over the Sinai Peninsula, Golan Heights, the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. It took the Israelis six days, hence the name of the war. Now, in the wake of the war, the United Nations drafted the infamous Resolution 242. Once again, the British had a heavy hand in the language as if they hadn't drawn enough maps around this region. Resolution 242 stated that Israel must withdraw armed forces from the territories occupied in the recent conflict and called for the termination of all claims or states of belligerency and the respect for and acknowledgement of the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of every state in the area and their right to live in peace with secure and recognized boundaries, free from threats or acts of force." End quote. Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and later Syria all agreed to these terms. But it's worth pointing out a couple of things. First off, the Israelis would take kind of a loose interpretation of the first note, the withdrawal of, quote, armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict. See, the resolution didn't say the territories, just territories. So the Israeli government would interpret this as territories essentially of their choosing since it wasn't specific. The other part of the resolution was a no-go for Palestinians because it called for political independence of, quote, every state in the area. Palestine wasn't a state. And even though by this time it had representation in the form of the PLO, the PLO didn't have a state to affirm in the negotiation. The only reference to Palestinians was that there should somehow be a way to a just settlement of the refugee problem. That's it. 
So it would be 20 years before the PLO finally acquiesced to this framework as set out by Resolution 242. But by now, the U.S. and Soviets were involved to varying degrees, selling arms into the region, failed diplomatic attempts to bring all the parties together, everyone eyeing one another with suspicion, but no one willing to take the first step among Arab nations and Israelis to negotiate the 242 framework. Egypt started what President Anwar al-Sadat called the War of Attrition by shelling Israeli strongholds around the Suez Canal and initiating dogfights. So soon the Soviets were chipping in their support for Egypt, which led the Americans to amplify their support for Israel, which began forceful retaliation against Egypt, but without committing American troops, which everyone knew would be a disaster. Arafat seized an opening in 1969 to formally take over the PLO and declared himself in charge of the organization and then spent the next several years both building a political apparatus and carrying out high-profile attacks on Israeli infrastructure, cross-border raids, hijacking airplanes, and an event that put the concept of terrorism on the map forever. Ten days into the 1972 Olympics in Munich, a militant splinter group of the PLO called Black September raided the Israeli athletic complex and took several people hostage. Black September's goal was twofold. The first was a swap. The group was calling for the release of more than 200 Palestinian prisoners in Israel. The second was notoriety. When two Israelis fought back, Black September killed the two men and all hell broke loose from there. Both Black September's plan and the German rescue plan were badly botched. Five of the eight terrorists were killed, the rest captured, but not before they executed all nine hostages. But it was the second objective that was achieved beyond the PLO's wildest imagination. As NPR writes in a recollection of the events, quote, When television networks finally switched to covering the hostage crisis, it created the aspect of the attack most notable today. It was the first time a terrorist incident had reached a global audience during a live broadcast. About 900 million people are believed to have watched the hostage crisis on television." End quote. The PLO was on the map for better or for worse. In the Arab world, the plucky band of resistance fighters under Arafat were doing God's work and punching above their weight. The Western world, however, understood that the PLO had changed the game and proven that it didn't take a conventional military to strike fear into the hearts of millions of people. In 1973, Egypt and Syria attacked Israel, resulting in thousands of casualties on both sides in what's referred to as the October War. It's sometimes referred to by Israelis as the Yom Kippur War and by Arabs as the Ramadan War, a reminder of the increasingly religious significance of the fight between the two Abrahamic religious states that were once allied as a people. It also raised the Cold War stakes dramatically, drawing Brezhnev and Nixon to the diplomatic brink and putting nuclear options on the front burner. With tensions running extremely high, the great powers convinced all sides to reach an armistice, with the Israeli forces technically notching a victory, though it only served to harden the resolve of the Arab states against both Israel and the United States. The lines drawn in the sand by the British and the French were now being guarded by the Soviets and the Americans. The Americans would eventually become the most staunch defenders of the state of Israel, though the relationship went through several ups and downs. The problem on the Palestinian side where its supporters were concerned was the lack of a state actor or recognized authority. Now that would change in 1974 when the United Nations recognized Arafat as the leader of a legitimate body that represented the people of the Palestinian territories. In addressing the UN for the first time, he said, Today I've come bearing an olive branch and a freedom fighter's gun. Do not let the olive branch fall from my hand. It was now state against quasi-state. From an economic perspective, the Occupy's territories took on a new life. Israel's defense ministry established a policy called Open Bridges to allow Palestinians in the West Bank the right to travel back and forth to Jordan and to work in Israel, though laborers were required to return to the occupied territories by nightfall. Then it made two critical infrastructure moves to take control of the water supply and the electric grid of the territories. Moreover, it used its economic leverage to dictate the terms of trade. Here's Galvin again. Quote, the Israelis found a captive market in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They enjoyed exclusive rights to export manufactured goods to the territories and, because Israeli farmers had access to subsidies, denied residents of the territories, were able to flood the Palestinian market with cheaper agricultural products. Land use restrictions, production and marketing quotas, Jordanian import controls, and access to the Israeli labor market all served to change the orientation of the Palestinian workforce away from agriculture toward employment in Israel. 
Within four years of the 1967 war, about half of all workers from the occupied territories regularly commuted to jobs in Israel. This created a subservient colonized workforce that was now entirely dependent on Israel for work, food, water, and electricity. It's important to understand the chasm between the intent behind these policies and the eventual market economic forces that would obliterate them. The intent was to actually make life livable in the territories by allowing them to work in Jordan and Israel, move about freely, during the day at least, and access more mature Israeli infrastructure. But the subsidies and trade restrictions rendered many markets within the West Bank and Gaza unproductive and wholly uncompetitive. So that forced workers to look elsewhere. And the hardened borders allowed the right-leaning political surge in the late 1970s to take a different approach to the concept of movement. The Likud party was a fundamentalist party on the right in Israel that ran on a platform that stated, quote, The right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is eternal and indisputable and is linked with the right of security and peace. Therefore, Judea and Samaria will not be handed to any foreign administration. Between the sea and Jordan, there will only be Israeli sovereignty, end quote. In 1977, Menachem Begin rose to power as the head of the Likud party. The leader of the militant Jewish insurgency, Irgun, who'd battled with David Ben-Gurion just 30 years prior, was now in charge, and Israel would take a hard right turn from this point forward. In 1978, the new Likud government began closing the borders on a regular basis and started importing labor from other parts of the world to displace Palestinian workers. By the year 2000, it all but shut worker mobility down entirely and unemployment in the occupied territories would surge past 50%. The labor Zionist movement was over. The land Zionists were now in charge. In putting this series together, I've come to view the story of modern Palestine in three distinct chapters. The first takes us from the 1880s and the first Aliyah through the Nakba. The second stretches from the Nakba in Israel's state recognition in 48 through the October War in 1973 when the UN reaffirmed Resolution 242 in Resolution 338. And that was followed by a recognition of the PLO as a legitimate governing body of the Palestinian territories, though not yet an official state. Now the third period for me ranges from 73 through October 7th of this year. Let's look at the transition between the second and third period. In an essay from socialist activist Moshe Mechover, he contextualizes the PLO's evolving approach in the lead-up to the resolution and after recognition as a governing body. Quote, from 1969 until 1974, the PLO unambiguously called for the liberation of the whole of pre-1948 Palestine, including not only the West Bank and the Gaza Strip occupied by Israel since 1967, but also Israel itself, and establishing in it a unitary, secular, democratic state. However, from 1974, the PLO began to shift its position, and by the 1980s accepted a two-state solution. An independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which would exist alongside Israel. Thus, the PLO was resigned to giving up, at least for the foreseeable future, the Palestinian claim over 78% of the territory of pre-1948 Palestine." End quote. Gaining consensus and political control over the disparate occupied territories would be a puzzle that Arafat never mastered. In the Six-Day War, for example, the Golan Heights were seized by Israeli forces from Syria. A few years later, the Syrians attempted to reclaim this territory in the October War, but the Israeli forces beat back the incursion, leading to an armistice between the two nations. Then in 1981, Israel unilaterally annexed the Golan Heights and immediately began settling the region despite an outcry from the Arab nations and the United Nations. Amid the shifting strategy of the PLO toward a more serious diplomatic stance, the Carter administration attempted to negotiate peace in the region that could eventually lead to statehood for Palestine and security for Israel. As we covered in our series on the Carter years, the Camp David Accords were notable for its ambition and lack of understanding of the players. For example, Jordan was excluded from the talks between then Prime Minister of Israel Menachem Begin and Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. Furthermore, the most crucial element of the negotiations where the Palestinians were concerned was the encroachment of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories and the economic stranglehold over the infrastructure in these areas. While the Camp David Accords led to a settlement between Egypt and Israel, that resulted in Israel returning the Sinai Peninsula to the Egyptians in return for recognition of Israel and normalization of trade relations, the settlement issue was negotiated in a side letter that Begin just kind of ignored. 
Within weeks of the agreement, which was lauded by the Western world, Begin continued a policy of aggressive settlement expansion. Egypt was seen as a traitor in the eyes of the Arab world, and Sadat would pay the ultimate price by being assassinated. The settlement expansion only hardened the resolve of militants in Gaza and the West Bank and challenged the legitimacy of the PLO. And while the Carter team took its eye off the rest of the region, they underestimated sympathies throughout the Middle East with the Palestinian cause and against U.S. interventionism. When the Iranian Revolution broke out in 1979 and U.S. hostages were taken in the overthrow of the embassy in Tehran, all the positive feelings from Camp David had all but evaporated. Matters with Egypt might have been settled between Egypt and Israel and appear satisfactory to Western powers, but it caused a huge rift among Arab nations. Moreover, Jordan was still smarting from being snubbed during the negotiations. Others, such as Syria and Lebanon, remained opposed to Resolution 242, with Lebanon providing safe harbor and a headquarters for the PLO. Now, using the pretense of an assassination attempt of Israeli Ambassador Shlomo Argov, IDF forces launched an assault against Beirut. Though it was known that the attempt was carried out by forces loyal to Abu Nidal, a former member of Fatah who had been expelled, Israel conflated Nidal with the PLO and set out to destroy Arafat and those who shielded him in Lebanon. This was yet another bloody turning point that would come to characterize the doublespeak between the PLO and the Likud party in conflicts going forward. And though it didn't last very long, the casualties were extraordinary and caught many of the world agencies by surprise. I mean, to this day, there's no consensus on the total number of casualties from Israel's invasion with the support of Western allies. At the time, Lebanon was experiencing a tremendous internal strife and was already growing wary of PLO presence. In other words, it had no real army to put on the battlefield, which didn't matter because Israel took the battle right to the heart of Beirut, where Catholic relief agency Caritas placed, quote, the minimum established figures of 14,000 dead, 25,000 severely wounded, and 400,000 totally homeless. By the next year, many agencies had revised the number of killed to around 48,000, though even these numbers remain uncertain due to poor reporting from Lebanese police and the inability to identify Lebanese citizens in the rubble. But it's estimated that 80% of the casualties were civilians. At the time the initial figures were released, Israeli Defense Minister Ariel Sharon, future Prime Minister, stated that he thought that there were only about 2,000 casualties and that they were mostly military. Though it would ultimately lend its support to Israel and even commit troops in support of the IDF, according to the U.S. State Department, quote, the Reagan administration was divided over how to respond to Israel's invasion. Secretary of State Alexander Haig argued that the United States should not pressure Israel to withdraw without demanding that the PLO and Syria do likewise. Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, Vice President George Bush, and National Security Advisor William Clark wanted the IDF to withdraw immediately and to sanction Israel if they did not, end quote. The PLO would wind up on its back foot and completely disorganized, though Arafat remained in tenuous control. But the attack on Lebanon produced a different result that would come back to continually haunt Israel to this day. In the book Hezbollah, author Augustus Norton writes, quote, The invasion gave Ariel Sharon carte blanche to pursue his own dream of destroying the PLO as a political force in the region and putting in place a pliant government in Beirut that would become the second Arab state after Egypt to enter into a formal peace agreement with Israel. Within the Israeli government at the time, as within the American foreign policy establishment, there was little understanding of the developments underway among Shia Muslims of Lebanon, and no analysis was made of the impact of this invasion on them." End quote. Future Israeli prime ministers would eventually grapple with the ramifications of the invasion. Ehud Barak said, quote, When we entered Lebanon, there was no Hezbollah. We were accepted with perfumed rice and flowers by the Shia in the south. It was our presence there that created Hezbollah. Yitzhak Rabin said Israel had, quote, let the genie out of the bottle. The Reagan administration may have misunderstood the dynamics of Islam and the alliances in the region, but they did understand the disaster that would come if Arafat was martyred. So they actually wound up helping Arafat flee Lebanon for Tunisia, where the PLO would set up camp once again in exile and away from the Palestinian people. And as much as Arafat enjoyed the support of the, of the Palestinian people, they weren't exactly waiting for him to save them. Beginning in December of 1987 and lasting through 1993, Palestinians organically rose up against the IDF in a series of ongoing skirmishes and campaigns designed to destabilize the military control over the territories. Now, this period became known as the First Intifada, 
Dennis Ross, who came to know Arafat really well, said, quote, The first intifada took Arafat by surprise. Here were Palestinians in the territories resisting Israeli occupation and capturing the attention and sympathy of the world. Here were the Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem organizing, planning, and guiding the resistance. Where was Arafat? Where was the PLO? End quote. Arafat, the military leader in his trademark fatigues, needed a makeover. Building upon the newfound sympathies for the Palestinian people, Arafat tried his hand at diplomacy and, as Ross writes, quote, engineered the PLO's adoption of the Algiers Declaration, which called for a two-state solution to the conflict with Israel. Forty years after rejecting the partition plan, the Palestinians were now ready to accept a Jewish state alongside an Arab state, end quote. Hardliners in the Arab world, in Israel, and among Palestinians weren't pleased, but there was enough support and war weariness that this approach would take center stage over the next few years. Below the surface, however, anger grew among the far right on both sides. Just like 82 was the birth of Hezbollah in Lebanon, 1987 marked the beginning of Hamas in Palestine. For as much as this was an inspired period for the resistance and urged Arafat to get more involved in finding political solutions, IDF forces would exact a heavy toll on the young members of the uprisings. Here's Galvin. Quote, Between 1987 and 1993, Israeli soldiers killed between 900 and 1,200 Palestinians and injured about 18,000. About 175,000 Palestinians passed through Israeli jails, and Israeli human rights organizations estimate that about 23,000 Palestinians were subjected to harsh interrogation and torture. The Israeli army destroyed about 2,000 Palestinian houses as punishments, and it's estimated that by the end of the Intifada, the standard of living in the territories had declined 40 percent, end quote. One of the architects of the Israeli response to the Intifada was Defense Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who created and oversaw the Iron Fist policy to break arms of any child who threw stones at Israel's military. Rabin was elected Prime Minister of Israel in 92 and, like Arafat, wound up taking a more diplomatic turn as the head of the Labor Party and heading into the Oslo Accords. Two former militants, who made their bones in brutal ways, would be facing off under the diplomatic eyes of the world. The Oslo Accords, the first in 93 and second in 95, was a political detente of sorts, but it served to exacerbate tensions among hardliners in Israel and the occupied territories. Though Gelvin notes that 60% of Israelis were in favor of the Accords, and the PLO, which was desperate for legitimacy at this point, attempted to put forward a softer approach, it further fractured the far right of both parties. The PLO accepted Resolution 242, while Rabin put a pause on Israeli settlements in the midst of a flood of Jewish immigrants from the crumbling Soviet bloc. This took a huge swath of the pre-1948 territory off the table for Palestinians and pressured the Israelis to both absorb new settlers at the same time they halted settlement expansion. Again, Ross, quote, Dr. Baruch Goldstein, a settler from Kiryat Araba, just outside of Hebron, saw the peace process with the PLO as a historic mistake and the prospective turning over of land to the Arabs as sacrilege. On the morning of February 25, 1994, in the city of Hebron, he entered the tomb of Abraham in an army uniform, walked into the adjacent Ibrahimi Mosque, and gunned down 29 Arabs while they prayed, an act of murder designed also to kill the Oslo process. End quote. Palestinians were enraged by this event and the notion that Arafat had given away way too much in the negotiations. This led to the increasing popularity of Hamas, which had gained credibility in the eyes of Palestinians who were increasingly hemmed in. In 1995, a young Israeli militant named Ben Gavir hoisted the hood ornament from Yitzhak Rabin's car, declaring to cameras, We got to his car, we'll get to him too. Now, this took on some importance on two levels. The first is that Rabin was assassinated just a few weeks later. More presently, Ben Gavir was part of the conservative bloc of politicians last year that made an alliance with Netanyahu and surged the Israeli government to the far right. In his office, he prominently displays a picture of Baruch Goldstein. The Oslo Accords marked the beginning of the end of any serious attempt to reconcile Resolution 242. The Likud party once again took over the Knesset, ushering in the first of the Netanyahu administrations. Entering the 2000s, Israel would continue to isolate the occupied territories economically and continue with settlement expansions, leading to the second intifada that lasted from 2000 to 2005. This led to the construction of Israel's defensive shield known as the Iron Dome. 
The Palestinian cause would be all but forgotten in the Western world after the attacks of 9-11, and Israel strengthened the diplomatic relationship and the personal relationship with the United States as its chief ally in the region. In the mid-aughts, things shifted politically once again. Yasser Arafat, who was outmaneuvered on the diplomatic front and was never able to align the factions within Palestine, died in 2005. Mahmoud Abbas was elected as the head of the PLO, and then Israel pulled all of its settlements from Gaza, leaving it completely open and unguarded. Abbas was to rule over both Gaza and the West Bank, as Arafat had done prior to the umbrella organization called the Palestinian Authority, established and recognized by the United Nations as kind of the, the political body of the territories. Below the surface, however, another political movement was bubbling, and you might find the support of it kind of surprising. Here's an excerpt from The Intercept to explain. Quote, Brigadier General Yitzhak Segev, who was the Israeli military governor in Gaza in the early 1980s, told a New York Times reporter that he had helped finance the Palestinian Islamist movement as a counterweight to the secularists and leftists of the Palestine Liberation Organization and the Fatah Party, led by Yasser Arafat, who himself referred to Hamas as a creature of Israel. The Israeli government gave me a budget, the retired brigadier general confessed, and the military government gives to the mosques. Hamas, to my great regret, is Israel's creation. Avner Cohen, a former Israeli religious affairs official who worked in Gaza for more than two decades, told the Wall Street Journal in 2009. Back in the mid-1980s, Cohen even wrote an official report to his superiors warning them not to play divide and rule in the occupied territories by backing Palestinian Islamists against Palestinian secularists. I suggest focusing our efforts on finding ways to break up this monster before this reality jumps in our face, he wrote. In an attempt to divide and conquer the PLO by funding Hamas, the Israeli military helped foster the organization, which by this time was already receiving aid from other Arab allies in the region. Hamas was a militant organization at its core, an Islamist by its founding, but it also understood the importance of building credibility beyond insurgency. And so it used foreign funds to build a military infrastructure, as well as schools and mosques and hospitals. Thus, it shouldn't have come as a surprise, though it certainly did to outsiders as well as Abbas, that when the PA called for elections in the territories, Hamas won a majority of seats and used this political capital to take over all of Gaza. That's not surprising because they were the only ones there on the ground the whole time. They grew up with the people of Gaza. Though the Palestinian Authority was granted the status of non-member observer state in the United Nations in 2012, it's no closer to being recognized as a formal state. Netanyahu was re-elected again in 2009, and but for 18 months in the beginning of 2021 under corruption charges, he's served in the role since this time as the longest tenured prime minister of Israel. Despite attempts in 2014 to reinvigorate Oslo, it barely came to fruition as Palestinian fighters continued to resist the occupation and Israel furthered its stranglehold on the territories. On May 30, 2018, Gazans organized a march to the border wall to protest the occupation. On the order of the Israeli government, the IDF opened fire on the gathering, killing 14 Palestinians and wounding hundreds. This act led human rights organizations to condemn Israel's actions as a violation of international law. In that same year, President Donald Trump unilaterally moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, saying, quote, The Jewish people appreciate it, but the evangelicals appreciate it more than the Jews. In 2021, the long simmer was coming to a boil. Human Rights Watch, a New York-based NGO, formally declared Israel an apartheid state. Arab-led attacks on Israeli Jews in Jerusalem inflamed tensions in the holy city. Israeli police then restricted Palestinians from entering the old city during the month of Ramadan, followed by Israeli demonstrations by a group called Lahava, whose supporters chanted, Death to the Arabs, writes the Council on Foreign Relations, which continues saying, quote, at the same time, Israel's courts paved the way for the evictions of six Palestinian families from a neighborhood in East Jerusalem called Sheikh Jarrah and for Jewish families to move into those homes." End quote. As we covered before, there's no such thing as a monolithic position on the issue of Israel-Palestine. Young progressives, for example, take a hardline stance against Zionism, hard stop. Black and brown Americans tend to feel the same sense of outrage against the state of Israel recognizing it as a colonizing force against an indigenous people. Jewish Americans predominantly support the rights and actions of Israel as proud Jews and supporters of birthright. Some secular Jews on the left, however, have called for an end to the occupation and certainly a ceasefire. 
Perhaps the most bizarre alignment, of course, is between right-wing evangelicals in the state of Israel, as Trump inelegantly noted. But there's truth and logic to this sentiment. In their reading of the Bible, the Abrahamic covenant is basically that Israel's children will return, a battle will ensue, and the rapture, a term not found in the Bible, will begin, and God will call his true children to heaven. Now, the important piece for the evangelicals is that the Jews must be in place in Israel for this to happen. Of course, they don't mention the second part, which is that they'll be forced to accept Jesus Christ as Savior or be vanquished with the rest of the heathens on earth. In other words, it's a mess. A mess of imperial design. In the end, the only people who matter in this are the Jews and Palestinians of the region. And as we'll talk about in a brief epilogue to the series, October 7, 2023 might mark the next and perhaps final turning point in the history of the region. My hope with this series was to lay out as much context as possible to help you draw your own conclusions about the events that have recently transpired. Now, I've tried to limit any emotion or personal feelings so as not to distract from the narrative. But in the epilogue, I'll talk more about the horror unfolding in Gaza, options for peace that were never fully pursued or were made impossible. And I'm going to return to the thesis of this exercise, that Palestine is the land that imperialism left behind.